Welcome to Exponential Opportunities, where we deliver smart business growth advice from the best hustlers around. I'm Jason Trofe, and today we have on the program Growth Hacking's L'Enfant Terrible, Vin Clancy. He's one of the most infamous marketers in the world. He's known for his cutting edge growth hacks and groundbreaking ideas. Whether you think he's unconventional and controversial, his ideas shock the world. His growth hacking book titled Secret Sauce raised over $100,000 in pre-orders. He then supported that with a 100 date speaking tour in 10 countries around the world. Vin spoke in nearly 40 different cities in 10 different countries, and he's been featured in publications including Fortune, The Daily Telegraph, The New Statesman, Wired, Vice, and Inc. Magazine, and he coaches company founders on how to growth hack their own businesses. His speaking engagements at conferences and events around the world focus on marketing, sales, social media, and writing. One speaking event in particular at South by Southwest V2V in Las Vegas was titled Growth Hacking in Real Time, and it was voted the best talk. Vin is the founder of the online magazine Planet Ivy and Screen Robot. Together, those websites received 20 million page visits with zero marketing spend. And content he oversees for clients has over 150 million page visits so far. His current online magazine is a Facebook group. It's titled Traffic and Copy. It's got high daily engagement and contributions from thousands of entrepreneurs. Right now, Vin teaches company founders and marketing managers how to grow their companies through a combination of rapid social media growth and guerrilla community management tactics. Next up for Vin, disrupting the multi-billion dollar coaching, consulting, and personal development market. And he warns us to watch this space. All right, Vin, it's awesome to have you on here. I'm so excited is to figure out you know how we can learn something from you that can help us you know get somewhere on the internet uh, you know where a lot of people have struggled to actually make a splash in the world you've gotten past that point so you know I want to get down to the bottom of how you did that and how mm -hmm. we can you know do that for ourselves and you know if uh, if you could help us understand you know how you overcome some of the struggles that that you know we all face when we try to put content out there or you know maybe there's there's tactical technical and uh strategy you know points that that we can that you i know you teach these things that you can get down to but really like how how did you do what you did and if you were starting over today how how would you go about it how would you get started all right so the, the question is if you're if you're at the start of your journey or maybe you already have a business uh, how do you get started with online marketing that actually makes a difference to your bottom line yeah yeah so the first thing you need to know is who your customer is where they hang out online and how you're gonna reach them that kind of sounds like business 101 but you see people making very general mistakes um, like they're not targeted in the community they grow and then they send out generic content. Gary Halbert said you should find your prospects problem and jump up and down on their head until it squeezes out of their eyeballs. <laughs> uh, so by that, um, you know, the marketing message, uh, could change pending who you're looking to reach so for instance uh, in real estate it's going to be very different if you're trying to reach single people or married people um, so typically you could try and sell you, your house by saying um, the house looks great it has a garden uh, you know it has a beautiful pool uh, these are the features they are not the benefits um, if you, if you really knew your audience, you could understand that uh, they could be married and they could be insecure that their partner is going to leave them. So your marketing message could be um, buy a house so beautiful they'll never want to leave you. Uh, and then you, you'd hammer right into their insecurities. So copywriting is key because if you don't have that killer message, it won't matter how good your megaphone is. So, so firstly, you need to have a killer message uh, which really connects with your audience, depending who they are. Secondly, where you market. Um, I, I'm hesitant to say where you should market um, because it, it could really vary. Um, but the first thing I would always set up is an affiliate system where anyone who passes you leads, you're going to give a percentage of. 
um, and then actively go out and find people who can give you leads. So one thing uh, that I do from time to time is I'll create a short selfie video of like 10 to 20 seconds, just being like, hey, um, this is what I'm working on. This is who I'm looking to meet. Can you uh, help me uh, connect with him um, or her? Um, and then you send that as a private message to everyone in your Facebook, everyone in your Twitter, everyone in your email. So you take one message that is personal and you blast it as if it's public. Now, everyone who receives a private message thinks, wow, they've taken time to spend a video, um, but you've actually just sent it to a lot of people. So what that means is you create the illusion of intimacy across many, many different channels. Um, so it's really about having a unique message and then using the internet as if you're making a thousand phone calls through things like direct messaging. Gotcha. That makes a ton of sense. You know, when I get those obvious bot calls and tweets and things like that, when they're just, you know, auto replies or those messages in my inbox that are just completely off, you know, they look, they're in marketing world. They, they sound so disconnected from a, a personal message. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, I don't even look at it. I don't even really respond to it, but I've, I've seen your messages and they do seem to be directed direct. Like it sounds like you're talking right at me. And I, I did get that a few times. I, I got a tweet from you and it sounded like you were asking me a question and I got thousands of tweets I didn't reply to because they're obviously not, they didn't feel the same way. So when you, you said they're connecting with the correct audience and I know you mentioned also that that sounds so fundamental that most people just roll their eyes at it, but, but there's an inner battle that happens. How do you know? When you think you're reaching the right audience and you're not, how do you know? Because I, I, I mentioned this before, but like the, the three questions that I think really stop us is, is anybody hearing me? Is anybody seeing me? And did what I say mean anything to them? Because it feels like you just, you know, put it out into cyberspace where it floats around in, in you know, deep space and nobody responds. How do you, how do you like overcome that? How do you connect with people? So before sales uh, comes engagement. So engagement is people liking your stuff, people replying to your stuff, people interacting with it. So you know that you're hitting the mark when you get engagement, and engagement is on the way to sales. Now you still need to have a killer offer, um, but in the first instance, you've got to have uh, people wanting to talk to you before you can try and sell to them. A lot of people try and go straight for the sale and that doesn't work. So um, in practice, what that means is you should be reaching out every day, normally following people um, or connecting with people, um, platforms like LinkedIn or friend requesting on things like Facebook. So be aggressive in building that network so that you have a fighting chance of people being able to actually see your stuff. Once you have a small following somewhere um, and you start to put out good content, you will get engagement. Okay. That makes sense. So, you know, what, this might be a weird question, but I'm just curious what, you know, what matters to us most usually is what will make us do things. And you touched on that with the house example, you know, what matters to them most is not the, the color of the roof, you know, those features and things that people list off. It's my, my wife not leaving me in, in that example. So, how did you personally connect that to some sort of calling that made you overcome, you know, what you've overcome to get, you know, millions of, of people's attention on the Internet? So um, I guess it goes back to uh, it could go into self-limiting beliefs. But um, for me, one of the most important things was and still is uh, a desperation uh, to succeed. And when you're as desperate as I was when I was on welfare four years ago, um, you know, suddenly those self-limiting beliefs don't seem so real when, when you're living off like a hundred dollars a week that the government gives you. Um, so I think you've got to tap into that desperation and that will guide you. And some people see desperation as a bad thing. Um, I don't really see it that way um, because I, I see a lot of uh, laziness um, and a lot of people who are scared to get the word out about their product. 
you know, if you believe you're producing something amazing, um, then you should have the confidence to tell the world about it. And that's all I did, really. I, I was I just had a laser focus. I had to get traffic to my website, my first online magazine. That was my startup. Um, and then I carried on and produced more magazines uh, and then ran an agency. So um, so I just pushed past it because I had to. Um, so it's like you put yourself in a position where um, you, you can't fail. Um, you don't have in the back of your mind, I can go and get a job if this works out. You know, that's one of the things that I hate the most when I'm talking to entrepreneurs. If I ask them the difficult questions, which I'm doing them a service when I do, and they fall back on, well, if it doesn't, if it doesn't work, I can do something else. That's like the ultimate cop out. It's like, you know, um, your, your partner is probably supporting you financially. And then you come out and say that, um, you know, every business should be the most important thing you do. Yeah. So that, that sort of comes back to an innate survival instinct kicking in you're using that you're you're tapping into that you know innate emotional response to death basically i mean to put it you know kind of frankly um and then i think that probably answers what i was going to ask next is you're scared to try something until until it's like you know feels like life or death and that's what makes you evolve you know, take a step out of your comfort zone. So, I mean, at this point of where you're at, what are you scared to try? Yeah, it, it, it never really leaves you. Um, I had a mentor, I have a mentor who has thrown down a very difficult challenge for me for this next year. Uh, and, um, yeah, it's made me realize that myself was playing a bit too small and uh, I could be playing a bigger game. Um, it was a, all of us reach a level and get comfortable. You know, I reach a level where I'm like, uh, I mean, I guess I'm in the top 5% or 10% or something. So I'm like, well, I'm doing really well, but, um, there's actually a lot more levels and a lot more I could be doing and, uh, an even better life I can create for myself. Um, but it will take a lot more work and a, a, a lot different thought process. So yeah, so we always get comfortable at a level, um, when we could be pushing harder, there, there's always more that, that can be done. Yeah, that's elaborate on that, if you will. Like, what's your big? If was there an aha moment when when you're in that with your mentor? Because a lot of the people here are are dealing with an overwhelm of of how to take on this challenge. And if you were to talk about what you're, what you're getting out of the comfort zone you're in, which is probably 10 steps ahead of most people listening. What is it? What's the big aha moment? And, you, and you've already tapped into that survival thing needing to kick in. But if you're in a comfort zone, like you're not on welfare now, how do you tap into that? Um, well, I mean, I guess I do something unhealthy and that's comparing myself with others. Um, I kind of see that as a good thing, um, because there's always a next level. And that's, what, uh, that's the funny thing about moving to Los Angeles is from London, England, where I'm from is, uh, every single week I meet these people, um, you know, people who are making millions from crypto, people who have revolutionized industries. So by being in the circles of people who are better than you, um, for want of a better phrase, um, that's, that's going to hurt your ego. So you, you're going to accept that that's going to hurt. But then once you can get over that, there's an inspiration there that uh, a better life is possible, uh, especially if you come from humble beginnings like I do. And um, like in my hometown of Kingston, Surrey, no one really had dreams. So... Um, it's like adjusting now I moved to London as like, oh, there's, there's a different world out here. And, uh, you know, through, through the music world, I eventually found the startup world. I was like, wow, you know, British people can be ambitious. And that was real inspiring. And then I come out to America and it's like, you know, I, I, I go to events at Britney Spears old house and, um, the, the, the networking, um, is insane because everyone is, you know, at the top level of the world. You know, I was at the Emmys a few weeks ago. Uh, this is like the ultimate top level. I was in the room with uh, De Niro, Nicole Kidman, um, you know, 
the top people from the industry, you know, I, I met uh, Donald Glover and, uh, you know, Dave Chappelle's there at the after party. So, um, so like there's this constant top level that reminds me that I ain't anywhere. Um, so, and that's what keeps me striving that there's always another level above that I should be working for. Yeah. So I think, is it Jim Rohn that said it? You're the average of the five closest people that you hang out with. Is that what it was? Yeah. I, I think about that recently because I, I am, I've been so angry with myself that my circle has been so bad for so long right. that no one told me about Bitcoin. Right. Now, right. Um, so I found a Bitcoin just very recently because I didn't have friends in the investment mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. So now we're coming into the game late. Not uh, too late. Yeah. Mm. Right. Me too. I, I've, I've got, I, I'm recently actually looking into cryptocurrency and blockchain technology and, uh, Ethereum tokens and, you know, looking at Bitcoin when it's 5,000 and now 7,000, I think per, Oh, it's just gone nuts. It's going so fast. Yeah. Uh, but that's that makes it that makes a perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. You know, you get around people who are who have a, a bigger mindset than you, and it raises your mindset. And first, you need to make it a must. It, it has to go from, and I'm quoting Tony Robbins, I think, or paraphrasing. It has to go from a should to a must. Yeah. And that's that survival instinct that kicks in. So whatever it takes to kick that in. So you're saying. Hang out with the people that are better than you. That will kick that in because then you're going to feel less than than them, and you're going to have to raise your your standards. So that that'll be raising your standards. Is that is that what you do? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Um, um, it, it sounds obvious, but checking your business bank account is the easiest way to be told that you are wrong. <laughs> yeah, I, I know all my numbers for everything for the past year. Um, net gross quarterly everything um you know that that's important because uh, i was speaking to my philosopher about this recently you know we can talk about the benefits of a product or service but as soon as you turn it into a business the numbers are tell you whether you're right or wrong there's, there's just no other way around it so you've mentioned two things now that i think you said you have you said you have a philosopher and you have a mentor and I think those are two things, especially the philosopher, that most people don't have. And if they want, they don't put in the work to seek out. Or if they seek out, they can't afford to pay for you know the ones that put themselves out there as available. And they just don't have the courage to to try and just you know cold call, cold email, cold walk up to people they wish they could mentor how did you find your yours and your philosopher how did you find these people um so so firstly the philosopher um is yeah that that's a bit of a unique situation how i i found that that's uh a, a friend of mine who, who became a philosopher but to to yeah. take it back to a level that uh, I think people listening can can get on. You know, the same people who say to me, Landmark Forum is a cult. You don't need a personal trainer. You should allow yourself to drink alcohol and coffee. Um, you know, you, you could change up your diet sometimes rather than eating the same things all the time. Um, they're the same people who say, I can't believe how much you're achieving. I can't believe how much you've done in the past year. And they don't see that personal development is linked. So... Right whether it's coaches or mentors or books or something, firstly, the first step is to believe in the concept of personal development. Um, a lot of people don't. They, you know, they'll, they'll see it in a negative light and they won't even have an open mind for it. Yeah. Um, so firstly, you have to have that. Believe it or not, pretty much any coach uh, is going to be better than the situation you're in if you have none because all they really do is repeat, um, repeat back to you what you're thinking. Right. Uh, an idiot check like it's all any coach really does is they just ask you fishing questions and you come to realizations yourself you know there, there is a ton of coaches on the internet right and uh, you know even if they're bad just the, the very aspect of self-awareness and self-reflection will improve you so okay so i'll just one last personal question about that because i think that part is a hurdle nobody's talking about around here 
before we get to the technical stuff, and then I'm going to ask you strategically how would you do what we need to do. But, you know, like connecting to that to that personal development thing and realizing that it's a must. It's not something you should be doing and it's okay to blow it off like you're talking about if you're going to work out and diet, but then you say it's okay to drink and eat cake too. You're just going to stay in the same place. And I think you know, myself included, we all have decisions we've made at different times and they're both in our head and they conflict. So today or this morning, I'm super healthy and I go to the gym. But this weekend, I've also decided I, I want to fully have as much funny as possible. So I drink and eat, you know, a Denny's or something like that, right? So these conflicting decisions in our, our head, you know, what was it to you that you had, you know, that aha moment, um, that makes every decision come from the right place. Did you have any sort of moment where that was an aha moment? Um, perhaps. Um, my early co-founder told me about something called the slight edge. Yeah. Slight edge is the reason most diets don't work because only a fraction of a percent each day does your body change. So you do it for two weeks, you think it doesn't work, and then you stop. Um, but over time, that slight edge multiplies and adds up to something. So I, so I think understanding that was important. And for me, um, yeah, uh, I, I, I realized there are many, many successful people who drink regularly, uh, who don't control their diet in any way, don't do any meditation, like uh, any personal development, um, and they can get by on raw talent. Um, but I've always been of the opinion that I don't have raw talent. So I just need to throw in every advantage to get those extra 1% um, that I don't even see now because they're invisible. Um, but I can perform at the highest level possible. The, uh, yeah, it's, it's not about skill, but uh, all I can really do is outwork anyone else. I, I can relate completely. I feel like I'm actually a little bit behind so it makes me put in the extra hours. I wake up earlier, you know, get up in the middle of the night. I wake up, I, I stay up later. I think sleep is important now, but I used to try to not sleep, you know, and try to make sure you're doing the extra work that it takes because I know if I just go head to head, I'm a little slower, in, you know, than a lot of people. So I, I know I, I have to know that about myself. And then, like you said, you know, keep the consistency and get that slight edge so that's basically that is a good segue into the strategy so you're all over the place all the time and there's obviously a consistency there and even when you get that feeling that nobody's watching and nobody cares and nobody's responding i don't know if you do or not or if you just overlook or don't see it you keep it going so is there a strategy like tactic i i I like to break it down you know and i think this is from like the art of war if you've read that but like they you know, the strategies overall, the tactics are the little battles, you know, but the general oversees the entire strategy with all the battles. And you, so you got the 30,000 foot view, you have the, then you have each channel you're, you're managing and what you're going to put out there. And it all links back to this like overarching contribution to the world, or, you know, if you want to put it that way, that you have to feel like pulled to do, you know, what is, what does that look like to you? Is that too broad of a question? Does that make sense? What's the question? <laughs> that is confusing. So I think I asked three questions in there. There's there's a there's sort of a draw of your contribution. What are you gonna put out? That's your content, you know, if you want to call it content. And then you have your you know, so what are you gonna say? You, you have a pitch. Let me just start with that one. You know, you have let's say it's a boring topic, you know, and you could say it in one thing and you also think nobody wants to hear you say it. So maybe you say it once, you know, what do you do about that? If you say something and no one hears it. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if let's say what you're selling is, is, is not, you know, extremely exciting. You know, a lot of people, they're not so like, like you've managed to sell Facebook advertising, more Facebook marketing, uh, advice, but there's thousands of people trying to sell Facebook advertising advice. What separates your messages from their messages? How come yours get traction? Well, for the most part, um, 
I built a personal brand around myself. So people know, like, and trust me from the content I put out before I ever ask them to give me a dollar. Um, and if you're just another faceless person selling real estate, well, I might buy from you, but there's 10 other people doing the exact same thing in your area. So if you don't bother to build a relationship through content, as soon as someone comes out who's $5 cheaper, I will, of course, go to them. I, I'll treat you as I would Walmart. Uh, you're fine unless I find something cheaper. Then I'll never speak to you again. That's so, a, yeah. yeah, that's a good point. So you personal brand, that's that's the yeah. edge that you're that you're using. So personal brand means, you know, what does that what does that mean to you? A uh, personal brand means authentically connecting with an audience by telling your story. Um, and that doesn't have to be a certain way. It doesn't have to be formal. It doesn't have to be informal. Um, it doesn't have to be cool or fashionable. It just has to have great domain knowledge for whatever it is you're selling. Gotcha. And so authentic, I guess that keeps it on. That keeps it on uh, on point, right? So you're always saying the same from the same place. You're not faking it. And I think when you, when you talk to salespeople, there there is a uh, a box, you know, and, and when they're trying to come onto social media and then sell stuff, they've got to step out of that comfortable box where they frame themselves, you know, with the, the guy in the nice suit, you know, who's got a product or a service to sell, uh, or a uniform, you know, whatever it is that they sell and, and get, do they get personal? Should they speak, you know, uh, about their personal life? What should they, how should, how do they, do that how do you get from that point to that point yeah i'm a big fan of bringing in the personal because all business is personal ultimately um uh, telling your story will help you to stand out uh i i see people who do that and who tell the story of where they are where they've come from get much better results than those who don't okay so would you advise people you know, if they're to, to just start talking about what they're doing on the weekend, just, just blabber. Um, yeah, just as, as long as they tag it back to what they're working on to make it relevant. Okay. So, uh, yeah, what they learn from X. So they have a point they want to get across. Let's say I'm trying to come up with an example and let's say this is the kind of guy that has a barbecue this Saturday. So he uses his phone and turns it on and says, you know, where he is and what he's doing and that he's at his barbecue and he's having fun. And the point he wants to make today is this is about, you know, the kind of things I can do that help people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, that shows he's a man of the people and the core audience will likely relate to that. That's good. That's good. Okay. So then, so then that's sort of a tactical approach, uh, you know, question, so there, there's personal branding. That's a good. That's a good uh, foot in. So now you're you're using that. You have a message. You keep it consistent. You're being sincere. You're being personal. You're you're being real. You're being transparent. And now there's a strategy. Where do you put that? Um, would you use Facebook over Twitter, or Instagram, YouTube? I know you that you're heavy on Facebook right now. You have a very large Facebook following in a in a group called Traffic and Copy, where you you teach people exactly how to do this. Um, you know, but would do, would you advise people who are just barely using Facebook, but they want to, you know, get online and and they they feel that urge of like I'm I'm just not partic if I'm not participating I'm like just going to fall farther and farther behind. What would you invite advise them to do? Start a start a group or a community, and if so, how, how would anybody care to get into your community? So. The key is aggressive following, so aggressive member growth, whether it's a Facebook group or an Instagram account or Snapchat account or whatever, plus showing up with content every day. If you can do those two things, you'll be successful in content. So, so every I, day. So yeah. let's say, would you pick one platform? If you're going to do every day, I think it could be overwhelming to pick a bunch. It would be great to be in a bunch. Yeah. But, so would you pick Facebook? Is that the one? Yeah, absolutely. Why? Because everyone is on Facebook from the top CEO to the youngest intern. And if you're selling something, you can get people to click on stuff a lot easier than on other platforms like Instagram and Snap. 
Good answer. So, so you go on Facebook, you be transparent, um, you, you, you be sincere, you have a message, you do it every single day. Your consistency is every day of the year? Yep, absolutely. Okay, every day. Uh, and then so the overall strategy. Now, now let's say you're doing that thing, you know, you're being personable, you, you slip your message in while you're being transparent and real. And um, now, now we're to the point where you want, you want a call to action. You know, you're doing this for a reason. Do you want to pull them out of Facebook into a capture page? Do you want to keep them on Facebook and use lead ads to, to capture a lead there? Or do you not even go there until you know people are paying attention? So, yeah, I would focus on building engagement because as soon as you do an external link to have them leave Facebook, it cuts your reach in half. So if you try posts without a link, they're going to get shown to a lot more people. So I would do for a few weeks just engagement, and then eventually you do an offer um, with an external link to get people to your website to grab their email or to sell them something. Okay. And that's more tactical stuff, and I think some of these things are things that you can Google and and find out. And so I'm trying to get, you know, uh, we we – there's services that will handle those things for you and, you know, those kinds of things are, are, they're definitely needed. They're definitely necessary. You can't catch a lead without a form and a CRM and follow up and sales. Um, but I think what stops most people, I feel like there's something else that's stopping people from, from doing that. They don't see this big picture that I see that you, you've nailed, you've nailed it. Like most people can't nail it. Um, what is that that I'm trying to describe here? What is that? How do people do that? So it's having the confidence to uh, tell people your story without fear of judgment. Um, we tend to believe that we're going to get in a lot more trouble if we're honest with people. If we step out of line for how society uh, expects us to react. Mm -hmm. But, you know. Great service businesses are based on people uh, where they are the brand. So you're going to have to get around that um, and tell your story and you'll connect with people way better than you would otherwise. So, yeah, confidence in your in being yourself and, uh, and kind of unapologetic uh, confidence in what you have to say. Yeah, yeah. Are you hearing me okay? Hearing it's breaking up over here. Yeah, it's yeah. starting to rain in LA. Uh, maybe that's caused problems. I don't know. Okay. Oh, okay. It, oh it just cleared up. Um, so, I mean, you're obviously very comfortable with yourself. You know, you're 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 laying in bed, so you don't have that that barrier that myself and a lot of other people feel uncomfortable just putting themselves out there. Uh, you know. What advice would you give to people that are just have that problem? Um, you're almost definitely in a highly competitive space. So if you try and be everyone else, you're just another face. So I would recommend you lean into being the way you really are. Uh, maybe you can't stop talking about sports. Maybe you're a big family person. Um, maybe you're really into TV shows and movies, but whatever it is, lean into whatever makes you the real you and uh, have that come across in your marketing messages. People won't expect to hear about, you know, someone talking about Netflix when they're talking about selling a home, but then they can connect with that and then be like, reply to that email like, oh, hey, I started watching Stranger Things because you mentioned it in your marketing email i really like it thanks for that yeah. that's a good point that's a good point i heard i think it was oprah say something that stuck in my head and it was you know help people connect with themselves which is yeah. a very it's a very deep statement in a sense because what you're talking about is you're not connecting with them you're connecting with people when you talk about Netflix or a show that you love to watch because they love to watch that show and it makes them connect with their own feelings that they have about that show. And now they're talking to you. Now there's engagement, right? That's what makes engagement happen. So yeah. that that's missing in a lot of, uh, I think, marketing messages. 
Um, certainly with, with stuff we've pushed out, we've missed the mark on that. And I think that a lot of people out there are still missing that mark. I think that, uh, you know, Gary V, Gary Vanderchuk points that out a lot. Um, even when people say they repeat, regurgitate that, that they don't do it and they don't do it consistently. Um, so, so would you say that's, that's a slight edge or is that your edge? That extreme comfort level? For sure. So that extreme comfort level, and I know we're, I keep getting off of, it might be off topic to some, but I think it's actually more on, more the part of the problem than the other stuff. How do you get that, you know, that, that comfort level with yourself? How did you do that? You just, you just have that your whole life already? Or, or was there like, no, it, 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 it grew in, um, I don't know if this is true, but like, um, one thing I'd say is that after I did my first year as an agency, uh, and I made a little bit of money, no, not a massive amount, uh, I knew I would never go back to being on welfare. It's pretty much when I discovered coaching, actually, like I, I, I will always have this. So I know I'll never go back to coach as to uh, welfare, um, so once you have that mindset, uh, you can be freer to take a lot more risks. Um, like we, we tend to think business is life or death at any given point. Um, but once you get a bit of traction and you realize you're not going to end up homeless anytime soon, um, then why not have fun with it? And then, uh, yeah, by chance, uh, it, it worked really well. And then when I actually started to really get into business strategy and theory from some of the best marketers of our time, uh, Dan Kennedy, Jay Abraham, uh, I realized I was accidentally doing what the best uh, in the world do. You know, Oprah, Anthony Robbins, uh, they tell a story, they authentically be themselves, and they stand out from all the copycats in the market who come and go. Yeah. Live from the inside out. Yeah. 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 I like that saying. So... um what do you uh, teach people to do then? You know, let's say if they can overcome that hurdle, which I think I, I made this mistake myself, and I think a lot of people do this. You get into all this <clears throat> marketing uh, training, but the part where, that I was just trying to address with you is really not uh, lined up. You know, lined up yet? You're not really, you're not really living from the inside out. You know, that part overcoming that. I think that's why a lot of the 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 people who are going to be watching this are not doing it. They just don't want to see themselves on there, out there, to exposed like that. You know, it doesn't mean they have to lay in bed when they're talking, but they have. To, that's that's what you really. You're not hiding anything. You're extremely comfortable with that, and I think it stops a lot of people from flipping on the record button or the live button, you know, and just go. Um, you know, I'd love to. I'd love to, you know, get some insight on, on how our guys can do that. And then, you know, if you, if you really, I think what, what is very important to these guys is if you had, you know, a hundred people that you knew if they were all pushing in the same direction, it would knock walls down like exponentially because, you know, the social graph, as I want to just like touch on for a second, if, in case other people don't really grasp that concept is, you know, Facebook and who's also cooperating with other platforms, Google, uh, you know, they've got a graph of who you're connected with and who they're connected with and then who they're connected with. So if you have a hundred people all pushing in the same direction, and I think it's Seth Godin that says your core 1000 real core 1000, you're set for life. If those are real core strong, um, real followers. Uh, but if we have a hundred, you know, that, that is a million strong. It's a million, it's a million reach of people that actually know the people that are in that group. It's, you know, if every person knows 10 people, that's a, it's a lot of people. Um, how would you, you know, leverage your, your actual sphere of influence with your spheres, sphere of influence? on Facebook? Um, so in terms of your, what, what you really need to do is to understand that there can be a lot more shortcuts that you could be taking. It's a uh, growth hacking, uh, is, is what the term is. So for instance, I have an ebook on 
ways to grow pack new clients. So how to find new clients on places like Craigslist that other people probably aren't looking. Um, how to use different social networks to automate how you reach out to people and create traction uh, in that way. Uh, so there's so much they could be doing that they're not, but it starts with the learning, uh, you know, understanding what growth hacking is. Um, which is why almost by accident with no paid media influencers um, or um, Facebook ads, um, you know, my book, Secret Source, a step-by-step -step guide to growth hacking, um, has made nearly $200,000 pretty much on autopilot. Um, because there's a gap between what people need to know and what's out there. Um, so it starts with wanting to learn um, and then moving up from there. Uh, just trying things out will push them through the wall better than, um, you know, listening to anything uh, anyone has to say. Just like learn the basics and then go out and do it. That's amazing that your book, <clears throat> that people launching books is, is a, it's really easy to fail. And that you actually did a Kickstarter, or was it Indiegogo? Well, you did a, you did a, a crowdfunding campaign, and you you hit a home run, and and since have even doubled that home run. Um, like, can you take us back to how you did that? Like step by step, how what is the growth hack? What was that growth hack? That got me off the ground. Yeah. So I, I got uh, hundreds of people to start writing content for me by creating an online magazine. So because of this, I had a big network of people creating content for me. And I, uh, I soon realized that about one in 15 articles would go viral. So one in 15 would um, bring me a ton of traffic, which was the key metric I was looking for on the site. Huh. So how did you use that at that point uh, to so get, to, yeah. That was the metric I needed to go to investors to say, I'm building one of the biggest websites in the world. You should invest in me. And then uh, they did. Wow. Wow. When you say viral, at what point do you call it viral? Like, is it how many shares or views? Sure. Visits? So we had articles that had over 500,000 page views. Wow. Single article. A single yeah. article with five hundred thousand page views. That's amazing. So, yeah. so, so you started a network. Uh, you leveraged a network of people who were contributing to your platform, which is a magazine. Yeah. And then, did you launch your book to those content writers? Were they content writers? Uh, I started public speaking, which I think is a great growth hack for anyone looking for a small number of clients who are going to pay you a large amount of money. Uh, because you instantly become the expert and the whole room has to listen to you. So mm. how do you become a public speaker? You go on Meetup and Eventbrite. You list your keyword. Maybe it's real estate. You find all the meetups and meetup groups. And then you, mess your, you message them a direct message um, that you're going to copy and paste and send to all of them. So they all think they get a private message. Hey, I'd love to give a talk on the 10 ways to make more money from real estate or whatever your niche is. Um, can I come and give a talk at your uh, meetup? I'm a big fan. I have a massive network I can invite. Just say that. They never check. And then send that to all of them. Uh, and believe me, one in four will get back to you. They need speakers as much as you need gigs. So that's how I would get started if you needed to get big clients immediately. Wow. That is a good uh, – so that's a growth hack. You you say – yeah, that's that's when I, I used – that was the only marketing I did for my agency was public speaking uh, when I first launched it. Wow. So when you did your public speaking, uh, this this comes back to being extremely comfortable with who you are, because I, you know I, I just saw some of your videos online in some of your speaking events, and you're outrageous. You know when you when you come out, you don't blend in with realtors if you're doing real estate. You are very different. How much do you think that contributed to your success? Uh, I mean, I, I was shy when I came out, and then by dressing a certain way, I, I, I kind of had to step into it and be it. Um, so I'm a big fan of stepping into feeling uncomfortable so that you become more comfortable as time goes on. Um, but you have to create a a kind of cult following around yourself. Yeah, 
I mean, that's that's a large statement. So you you stepped out, you forced yourself to step out of your comfort zone, and then you grew into it. You know, expanding that comfort zone, basically. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's 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 good. That's hard to do. That's hard to do. This is like that's like lifting heavy weights, and I think most people won't push that hard. That's why there's the one percent. Um, you know, what's, you know, what, what's your best advice that you would give to, you know, your younger self, someone not as far along as you, what, what would you, what's, what's the, the one key best secret piece of advice you, you would give yourself? Uh, probably that you're wasting a lot more time than you think. Um, so to analyze every part of your life and what you do and every decision you make is either bringing you closer or further away to where you want to get to. Uh, yeah. And also that, yeah, it, it's really hard. Like it's good to have some naivety to like fly with, but you got to understand uh, how hard it is to get started. Um, and to have any effect, um, you have to focus on the right things, be open to be vulnerable. Um, and you have to be open to the fact that you're going to be wrong every single day. I and mean, you have to understand that. Yeah. No, that's good. Vulnerability is that, that I think is hard in particularly, I think for guys more than girls. I think just because culturally that's in America anyway, more of a problem, especially with an, uh, an older generation. Um, definitely more accepted today than it was you know, a decade, two decades, three decades ago. Uh, and some of the people that need this more than anyone are of, are of another generation, you know, that it is harder for them to be th that transparent. And that is a, a struggle that I think they're, they're going to have to feel that survival burn to overcome and step into this and force themselves to, to grow their comfort zone larger than it was you know, last year, do something that makes them uncomfortable. Where can, where can they find your training and your book? Sure. So, uh, on vinclancy.com, uh, I have a guide that's free to dominating Facebook. Um, I'll send you another link to my new guide for how to grow fat, getting clients. So I write these free eBooks. Uh, you know, I wish I had them when I was starting out. So I write them for people who are unsure about marketing uh, and I have a ton of stuff on my site at uh, vinclancy.com. Um, so, yeah, I will in will include those links when it goes out. Um, and my Facebook group is called Traffic and Copy, so facebook.com slash group slash traffic and copy, um, where every single day I I'm giving away um, the best stuff I come across across the web. That's great. No, that's great. Yeah, well, that's, that's great insight, man. Is, is there anything else you want to you wanna add you know, any, any insights? Yeah. Um, so yeah, by, by educating yourself, you give yourself a big competitive advantage. You know, people have read my book, Secret Source, um, and they've got press in mainstream publications. Um, they've managed to get a ton more clients. So uh, whether it's my book or, or other things in growth hacking, yeah, it starts with education and accepting that it's hard to get clients. I want an easier way. And that's what growth hacking does. That's great. You want to you wanna gift our network a, a handful of books? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll send you some e-books. Awesome. Great, man. Thanks. All right. All right. Well, I, I had a good time. I'm glad I met you. Um, I hope to see you out in L.A. Are you coming? Do you have any conventions or, uh, you know, things coming up that maybe uh, people can meet you at or I can meet you at? Um, I'm speaking at Stacking Growth this Saturday, um, but I probably won't go out in time for that. Um, but, um, hopefully South by Southwest, I've spoken there the last three or four years. What, what sure. month is that? This is that 2018? Uh, yeah. In March. Yeah. March. Yeah. March. You're going to be, uh, South by Southwest, the Las Vegas one, right? Or, or is it uh, Austin? Austin, Texas. Austin. Okay. Okay. You spoke at the, the more, uh, the one in Las Vegas more is more tech oriented. Is that right? They have a tech part in Austin, but they also have the music part. Yeah, I think it's going to Europe now. Um, but yeah, there was one in Vegas. Um, yeah. yeah but that was really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I love I love that. I love South by Southwest. 
All right, man. I'm gonna, I'm gonna shoot for uh, coming out there in March. I hope to see you cool. there, man. You you uh you have you have that on your website. You're gonna be posting that already. Is it already on there? Uh, not yet. Uh, but I, I'm sure I'll be there. It, it, it's always good fun. Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks for All having right. thanks for uh, having us, Ben. All, All right. right. Cool. Bye bye.